If the accuser remains anonymous, then the accused should also remain anonymous. I don't think they, at all that if you're accused of rape, you, you shouldn't be in the newspapers at all. Proven guilty, yeah. The, the women that do that, false accusations, uh, they destroy that man's life, but they also destroy it for women that are being raped as well, because they make their case less tenable, don't they? Despite the commonality of false accusations of rape, there's no regard to the man in such situations. The woman is granted anonymity, whereas the accused man is free to be named to the public. The consequences of this, when the accusation turns out to be false, can be stark. The reason given for the woman's anonymity is that rape is a special crime and she must be protected from further harm. At the same time, the reason given for men not getting anonymity is that it's a crime like any other, so they should not get special treatment. Protecting the victim's identity, whilst broadcasting the accused's identity, is always open to malice and is a vicious double standard. If the man is guilty, then the evidence will show he is guilty. His name won't show he's guilty. How does that have any impact on it? If the woman is only coming forward if the man is publicly named, um, it would suggest other motivations which are slightly dodgy. I know that police think if the man is named, other people who, then, who, who were raped or attacked by him can then come forward. Um, but that is at, I mean, yeah, and that's the case, and I'm sure they, that's, that some men who are serial rapists have been, have been convicted that way, that other people have come forward. But that's at the cost of a great many innocent men's reputations. Um, and it's what you consider important. If you're willing to sacrifice, you know, 10, 100 men for every one serial rapist you bring down, then fair enough. I don't think that it's, it's, it's a good cost. I don't think it's a fair cost. The real power of rape lies in the accusation. The truth of the matter is irrelevant. Evidence is irrelevant. The accusation is everything. Yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's a horror you can only know once you've actually gone through it. Um, I know, I know that, that, that at any point in somebody could come forward and say he raped me and I, I, I would automatically be in trouble. I would automatically then have to find, it's not a matter of saying, well, I didn't do it. I would have to then find a way to prove I didn't do it, it's going to be really difficult, and anybody can say it about me. Women can freely accuse men of rape, with little fear of consequence. I remember the case of two policemen accused of rape, as if rapists travel around in pairs. And keep in mind that because these men are accused of a crime, they are police men. If the story had been about them saving someone's life, they would have been police officers. Two policemen who were on duty drove a drunken woman home after she had been attacked outside a nightclub and then raped and indecently assaulted her, a court heard today. Both men denied the charges. I thought, what has she got to lose? Her identity is secret. She's already ruined the men's careers, pensions and family relationships. If she wins, she'll get massive compensation from the state. If she loses, it's just another case of the legal system failing female victims. If she withdraws charges, she'll not be punished for fear of dissuading genuine victims. And if she's proven a liar, she'll face at most community service or a suspended sentence, and more likely, nothing at all. As predicted from the outset, in the end she was proven a liar. The rape charges were dismissed, and of course, no charges were brought on her. Often, the reasons for women crying rape are laughable. Laughable to everyone, that is, apart from the accused man. Women will lie about rape to explain their pregnancies. Women will lie about rape to get compensation. Women will lie about rape to get a payoff from a celebrity. Women will even lie about rape if they're not satisfied in bed. A teacher who went on a date and ended up having sex with the woman was accused of rape. He had sex with her, but made the huge mistake of not cuddling with her afterwards. Hey. What are you doing? Where are you going? Nowhere. I... I... I just have trouble sleeping in a strange bed. No, it, it has nothing to do with you, Helen, I promise. I really like you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll call you later. The police tracked him down and threw him in jail for eight days. She herself said she just wanted to frighten him for leaving so abruptly. 
no charges were brought against her. My own belief is that the vast majority of real rapes are not reported to the police. That's my belief. I believe if a woman is, gen un unless it's perhaps a, a serious, stranger rape, I believe that the majority of what I would call real rapes, in other words, where a man physically and forcibly imposes himself upon a woman who clearly does not want to have sexual intercourse at that point, I'm sure that the vast majority of those real rapes go unreported. At the same time, I also believe that the vast majority of rape accusations that are made to the police are mostly false. Firstly, when the matters are investigated closely, bear in mind, 25 out of every 125 rapes are, are clearly no crime. There's no doubt, real doubt. They're out of the picture. That's already some 20% of the whole, absolutely, definitely false. Uh, the second reason is that given the likely consequences for a man who is convicted of rape, a woman who makes an allegation of rape is a woman who's out to damage a man. I don't think there's any question about that. Even if she's a genuine victim and she has genuinely been raped, the point is that if she is making an allegation of rape which is going to go to the police and hopefully going to a courtroom, she is out to cause harm to that man. A woman might often feel like she's been raped, but no rape has actually occurred. A woman in Canada, for example, had the police track down and imprison a man for rape because, and this is true, he lied to her about being a secret government agent. She felt raped because she's an idiot. This kind of thing would be laughable, except men are paying a heavy price for a woman's hurt feelings. A man can spend time in jail when he lies about being James Bond, but no woman has ever spent time in jail for lying about being on the pill. If a woman believes that she has been misled, she will often think that she has been raped and then reinterprets what happened two or three nights before. She then seems to him in a completely different light. Now, it might be that she's seeing him in a true light, but the point is her attitude towards what he did and what his motivations were two or three, uh, two or three nights ago will have changed, and her memory of, and her own memory of how she felt about the incident will also have changed. Memories are like that. a Bristol woman who changed her mind during sexual intercourse uh, with her fiancé. Um, in the middle of the lovemaking, she asked him to stop, and he didn't. He continued. And um, she lived with him for a further two months, said nothing, did nothing, and then the relationship broke down. And so three months after that, she reported him to the police, and he admitted that on the night in question he had continued when she had asked him to stop, and he was sent to prison. Now, bearing in mind that this is an incident that took place between two people who were uh, engaged to be married, and that the woman decided basically that it was a rape some two months afterwards, and then took three months to make the allegation, suggests very strongly that um, women can reinterpret events from the past. They can uh, decide that they are going to punish their ex-lovers. Real rapes, when they occur, are terrible. Regretted sex, however, is not rape, no matter how much a woman might wish it was. If you have a date with a woman and that ends in consenting sex, but um, she was drunk and regretted it in the morning, would you think that you had done anything wrong? It depends how sober I was. If I was equally drunk, then if we were both drunk, we both had sex, it happens. There's a chance that you were drunk as well. And no, if you're both consenting at the time, then there's, no, you ain't done anything wrong. If she was just, her inhibitions had gone, um, you know, that's what happens when you drink, your inhibitions go. Um, if you don't want that to happen, then don't drink. But when it comes to date rape, <clears throat> the, you know, it's, 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 it goes back to the whole, um, the case of witchcraft, where all you have is the person being accused and the person accusing, and there's nothing else. Is simply a claim and a counterclaim. What does this poster mean? How can it possibly be presented that alcohol is some kind of weapon used against women by men? Women want to have sex as much as men do, and both sexes often drink to reduce inhibitions and have a good time. A girl in a nightclub has power because she's in a nightclub. Because guys who are coming there are coming to pick up and they're coming to look. 
And so a woman, is see, she's got low cut, she's got high low cut dress, she's got short Generally, skirt. She has power, she has power. So are women. You're coming there for that. That's so are women. For. That's what women go there for as well. Well, Don't let them yeah, deceive yeah, you yeah, and yeah, say they're yeah, going yeah, out yeah. just to have a dance and just to meet friends. That's, that's yeah, bullshit. They're going, they're going to display their power and to be looked at and to, you know, to basically control men. Men don't go prowling around forcing women to drink alcohol. Women choose to drink it. If they then behave in ways that they regret afterwards, that's not the fault of men. It's the fault of women. Are women incompetent, empty-headed imbeciles who can't make decisions or control their behaviour? Do they not have any choice in how much they drink? Is their alcohol consumption decided for them by men? If you don't want to give up your inhibitions, then don't get drunk. If you get drunk, you know the consequences. Your inhibitions may be a bit looser. You may you may go with, with, with a man you didn't necessarily wouldn't have gone home with if you were sober. And things might happen that wouldn't necessarily have happened if you were sober. It's the outcome of being drunk. We have some responsibility here. I remember a radio discussion in 2004 about the binge drinking of young women. An expert woman came on the show to explain why this was happening. She blamed the drinks industry for not labelling the alcohol content clearly enough. She blamed pubs and clubs for having happy hours. And then she blamed men for buying women drinks. But at no point did she blame women themselves for drinking too much. When a man drinks too much, it's his fault. When a woman drinks too much, it's everybody else's fault. Women seem to see themselves as helpless, not responsible for anything, as if they're simply objects to which things just happen. The woman is not responsible for it. I mean, they almost actually talk about women as if they're some sort of low IQ imbecile. We often expect more responsibility from children than we do from women. And yet these same women claim that they want equality with men. This is what misandry is about. It takes anything that could conceivably upset a woman, even when it's our own behaviour that's made her upset, and blames it on men. Reinterpretation of a sexual encounter is not rape. Claiming rape and then having consensual sex with someone else later that evening puts the lie to rape. Claiming to have withdrawn consent during sex, but not getting around to mentioning it to the alleged rapist is not rape. An invented sexual encounter is not rape. Consenting sex that only becomes rape when he doesn't call her the next day is not rape. Yet all of these gems have reached jury trial in the UK and the US.